بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته My dear brothers and sisters, welcome to another episode on this journey that we're taking together through the afterlife. We discussed previously the journey of the soul after death and the stages of the day of resurrection. And we started discussing in recent episodes the introduction to the description of the hellfire. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect you and I from the traps that lead to the hellfire. Today, inshallah ta'ala, we want to focus on the fuel and the intensity of the hellfire. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from that. What is the fuel of the hellfire? What fuels the hellfire? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara, nara wa quduha nasu wal hijar. A fire, the fuel of which is man and stones. Wa quduha nas wal hijar. Now here when it says nas, people, it's not referring to all people or generally people. It's referring specifically to the kuffar and the mushrikeen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us that the fire is fueled by man, by people, so that people will realize that this is something that is a reality, the punishment of the hellfire. As for the stones that are being used to fuel the hellfire, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best what kind of stones will be used. Some of the people of the past used to debate about the kind of stone like sulfur and, and so on and so forth. It doesn't really benefit us to know what kind of stone is being used. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could prepare whatever He wants for the Akhirah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا وَلَن تَفْعَلُوا فَاتَّقُوا النَّارُ الَّتِي وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَةِ وَعِدَّتْ لِكَافِرِ And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاتَّقُوا النَّارُ الَّتِي وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَةِ Then fear the fire whose fuel is men and stones. وَعِدَّتْ لِلْكَافِرِ It is prepared for the disbelievers. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never once in the Qur'an mentioned the punishment of hellfire for the believers. Rather the punishment of hellfire is prepared for the disbelievers. And it is fueled by those who are in the hellfire. And another fuel that will be used as well, aside from just mankind and the jinn and the stones, are the things that people used to worship. They used to worship these things alongside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what are some things that people worship? besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, the people who worshipped idols. The people who worshipped idols, they will see their idols in the hellfire with them. And this will be a form of disgrace and humiliation for the people who worship them. Why? The idols themselves are not feeling any pain or punishment. They have nothing to be held accountable for. But they're thrown into the hellfire and they're fueling the hellfire as a form of humiliation for the people who worship them. Is this the idol that you used to worship? What is it doing for you now? What is it benefiting you now? So the idol is also kindling the hellfire on the day of resurrection. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّكُمْ وَمَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ حَصَبُ جَهَنَّمْ أَنْتُمْ لَهَا وَارِدُونَ Certainly you, disbelievers, and that which you are worshipping now besides Allah are but fuel for the hellfire, and you will surely enter therein. And had these idols been gods, had they been real deities, they would not have entered into the hellfire and all of them would rather abide therein. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also roll up the sun and the moon. And so they will be rolled up into the hellfire on the day of resurrection. Why? Because people also worship the sun and the moon. Even in our times right now, there are still tribes and villages of people who worship the sun and the moon, and people who worship fire, and people who worship trees, and people who worship animals and spirits. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take these polytheists and these pagans, especially the ones and only the ones who received accountability, only the ones who received a true, complete, unaltered message of Islam, the message, the message of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they will be punished because of that accountability. But if they did not receive the accountability, then we leave their judgment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, we know the hellfire is severe. We know it is vast. If the fire was not hot, would people really fear the consequences? Of course not. If the fire was not a fire and there was a light punishment, something that was simple, most people would not mind committing sins or even kufr. Most people would not care because they don't fear the punishment. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a punishment that He knows is just and fair. 
and it is a motivator for the people who are balancing their hope in Allah and their fear of the punishment. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the intensity of the hellfire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa ashabu shimali ma ashabu shimal. The people of the left hand will be those of the people of the left hand, meaning the people of the hellfire. Fi samumin wa hamim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying about these people in the hellfire, in fierce hot wind and boiling water and shadow of black smoke. And that shadow is neither cool nor even good. Something very interesting about these three ayat right here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala includes all of the things that people use in this life currently when they're hot and they need some kind of relaxation, some kind of relief. So ask yourself, what are the three things that you seek when it's too hot? What are the things that you find for relief when it's too hot? And so one of these things is water. Everyone needs water. And the second is air, some type of breeze. And the third is shade. And all of these three things are the things that we use in this life as a form of relief to avail ourselves of heat in this world. But all of these things are mentioned in these ayat as forms of punishment. How is that so? So this water that is being mentioned is boiling water, the hameen. It is actually not a form of relief for the people of the hellfire. And the wind, the air that people usually look for is an intensely hot wind, a samum. And the shade that is mentioned here is al-yahmum. This shade is part of the smoke of the hellfire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the one who is able to do all things is describing how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using things that we use in this life for relief in the same exact way from heat. He's using them for the people who are in the hellfire as a form of punishment. And only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to do so. The same three things that you use in this life for relief are used in the akhirah, in the hellfire, as a form of punishment for the people of the hellfire. And we seek refuge in Allah from the punishment of the hellfire. Another indication of the intensity of the hellfire. And pay attention to this one. The Prophet wasallam said, The hellfire as we know it, or the fire as we know it, is one seventieth part of the fire of hell. It's one slash seventieth. It's a fraction of it. So somebody said, O Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it is enough as it is. The fire that we have is so hot, it is enough as it is. Can you even touch fire in this world? It is enough as it is. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the fire of hell is as if 69 equal portions are added to the fire as we know it. Allahumma ajirna min al nar Oh Allah, protect us from the hellfire. This hadith is mentioned in Al-Bukhari. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that this fire never calms down. It never ceases to burn. It doesn't lose its blaze. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَذُوقُوا فَلَنْ نَزِيدَكُمْ إِلَّا عَذَابًا So taste therein the results of your actions. Taste your consequences. Taste your rejection of Allah, the Creator, the one who made you. And the reject rejection of His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the one who was sent to you. And the rejection of the book that was revealed to you. Taste the punishment, the result of your evil actions. And we will not increase you except in more torment. We shall not increase you except in more torment and punishment. And we seek refuge in Allah from the punishment of the hellfire. One of the people of the past mentioned a very interesting story. This is a, a story about a man named Musa ibn Muhammad al-Hashimi. And he was one of the very wealthy noblemen of the Bani Umayyah clan. So he was very wealthy and he was a nobleman and he would remain throughout his life engaged in eating and drinking and partying. And he would waste all of his time following all of his desires, his lustful pursuits. He had some of the most expensive, elegant, luxurious clothings and he used to indulge in all of his sensual pleasures and he was a handsome young man that surrounded himself with people who were beautiful, beautiful men and beautiful women, completely disconnected and not caring about the rest of the world. All he could think about were his desires, his parties, his drinking of alcohol and his eating. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had showered upon this man so much grace and so much blessings and so much worldly bounties. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he showered 
these many bounties upon this man. It was mentioned that this man, most of his life, was receiving more than 300,000 gold coins every single year. And he spent all of it, all of it, on indulgence and pleasure and desires, lustful pursuits, entertainment, distractions. He wasted all of his time and money on these things. That's all he did. That's all he knew. And so this man, this wealthy nobleman, Musa ibn Muhammad al-Hashimi, lived in a very expensive mansion, a beautiful palace. He had large windows on one side which opened up to the main road, and he would sit beside these and watch the people walking outside. And the windows of the other side opened up to a garden, a beautiful fancy garden, an elegant expensive garden from which the cool fresh breezes blew in with the smell and the fragrance of the sweet flowers. And in the middle of his palace floor, in the main room, he had a huge pavilion. And it was made out of ivory and it was studded with nails of silver and gold. Look at his wealth and how he's spending it. And this Hashimi used to sit down in his pleasure dome. He used to sit and indulge. And he had a gem studded turban. He had a turban with gems studded into it. That's the bling of our time. He's sitting there with this expensive turban. Unnecessarily expensive. And he's sitting there with his close friends and he's sitting on his throne made out of silver uh, brocade, made with silver and silk brocade. And he's sitting there with his close friends and companions and there are some attendants nearby, people serving him nearby. As soon as he gives them an order, they respectfully uh, fulfill the command. And in the front of the pavilion, there were a bunch of d uh, dancers and singers. So these girls would sing to him anytime he wanted music. He would simply look at them and they would know that he wanted them to sing for him. So they would bring out the instruments and they would start to sing their songs. Anytime he wanted the music to stop, he would gesture to them and they would stop immediately. And so day and night, he had this entertainment, this music, this amusement, late into the night. And he was intoxicated with excessive alcohol. He was overpowered by his sleep and tiredness. He would tell his friends to, sleep, to leave so that he would sleep with one of the people that were there. And in the morning he would gamble and waste time. And he would spend most of his time focusing on his desires to the point where none of his friends or advisors ever spoke to him about depressing matters or any serious matters or death or disease or the day of judgment. Rather, everything was about amusement and entertainment and parties and gossip. And people every day would bring him different types of flowers and different types of perfumes from all over the world with rare flowers and rare, uh, rare fragrances. And this young man, Musa, spent almost 28 or 29 years of his life following these pursuits. And it was a huge portion of his life. So one night, he was sitting down as usual. He was about to party. The, the alcohol was being brought out. And he heard a very beautiful voice, a very beautiful, uh, amazing voice that he's never heard of before. And he said it was more beautiful and sweet and enchanting than any of the women that were singing to him. And he, st he started wondering, where is this voice coming from? He was really amazed and moved by it. It shook him, gave him goosebumps. And subhanAllah, he started shaking. And then he told the people with the music to stop. He told the people with the music to stop. He wanted to find out where the source of this beautiful sound was coming from. What happens next? We're going to take a short break, inshallah ta'ala. When we come back, we'll mention the rest of the story and we'll continue discussing uh, the hellfire, inshallah ta'ala. So stick around, inshallah, and we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Scale of justice will be broke before man. It's time to please Allah. A chance to gain reward. I will spend on you, he says. All on who spend in good cause. It's welcome again from me, from your host, Ismail Bullock, and from your host, Gabriel Romani. The parents have to encourage their kids to get married, right? and at the same time, support them. Yeah. What many people don't understand is that seeking knowledge in itself is ibadah. Mm. And Abu Hurairah radiallahu He spent all of his time with parties and drinking and gossip and music and girls and, and zina and fornication. He did everything you can possibly imagine a person doing with their wealth. Everything to indulge in his desires. That is all that he knew of. And as we mentioned before the break, this man heard something very interesting. 
One night he was sitting down listening to the girls singing to him, listening to the music, and he heard a voice like no other voice, a voice that was so enchanting, a melody, it was beautiful. And he started to tremble a little because the voice was shaking him. And he couldn't really understand or decipher what was being said or where the voice was coming from. So he commanded the people in his palace to stop singing. He told them to leave. He called his servants immediately. He said, I want you to find out where this voice is coming from. They said, what voice? And then they heard the voice and it would start and it would stop. They would hear it and then it would discontinue. He said that voice. He went out to the window to listen. The voice was so beautiful. So these servants of his, they went out to find the source of this voice. And he's sitting there waiting and he started to drink alcohol. And finally they come back and they tracked the voice to a young thin man. He's weak in his body. He looks very frail and fragile, but he's dressed in two simple white clothings. And he was standing in Salah in the masjid praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and reciting from the Quran. So they brought him to this nobleman, to Musa ibn Muhammad. So they caught hold of the man and he was trying to pray and they took him out and they said, we need to take you. And they didn't explain why they were taking him. When they came to Musa, they said, here's the man that you wanted, the person that you were looking for. He said, who is this person? He didn't understand what was happening because he was drinking. He said, who is this person? What is going on? They said, that's the, the voice of the man that you heard. He was reciting Qur'an in the masjid. We found him praying in the masjid, one of the salahs in the midst of the night. And we decided to bring him to you because you asked us to bring him to you. So this noble man, he tells his servants, his, his people to leave. And he talks to this man and he says, what is it that you were saying in the masjid? I heard your voice. What were you saying? What were you reciting? So the noble man asked him to recite and this poor young man started to recite Qur'an from different verses from different places. He said, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن المتقين في جنات ونعيم Verily, those who have taqwa, the believers, will be in a beautiful garden. A beautiful garden. He started reciting various ayat about the people of Jannah from different places in the Qur'an. عَلَى الْأَرَائِكِ يَنْظُرُونَ you will see in their faces shining with radiance and delight. They will be given pure wine to drink, which, which is sealed with musk. Verily, you should envy or race with one another, hasten with one another to race for this. This is the real race, the competition. So let the competitors compete. He started reciting about Jannah. These are the blessings of Jannah. Raise towards Jannah. Drink from the springs of paradise. And then he finished talking about Jannah and he said, Oh, you lost in delusion. He's talking to the rich nobleman. He said, you lost in delusion. What comparison is there between your mansion, between your palace and your throne and everything that you have here with the ones that are in Jannah, the ones in paradise? What comparison do you think there is? And he said, those in Jannah will be raised couches and thrones lined with silver brocade or silk brocade. He said, they have green cushions and they're placed on these carpets, the embroidery of which you have never seen. It will stun your eyes. And they're reclining on their thrones and the inhabitants of Jannah will see two beautiful gardens and two streams that will be flowing towards them. And in these gardens, there will be every kind of, of uh, fruits in pairs. And so they will have every kind of fruit in pairs such that each fruit will have a different taste, greater than the last. And the fruits of these gardens will never run out. And they will never be limited or forbidden to anyone, unlike the gardens of this world where not everyone is allowed to eat. He said the righteous will be in a blissful state. In these gardens, they will never hear idle talk. Or rude talk. Or any kind of envy or hardship. And there's gushing springs and goblets raised about at hand and cushions arranged and silken carpets spread on all sides so these people can lie down wherever they want or fly wherever they want or sit wherever they want. And they are in the cool shade. This is the reward of the righteous, enjoying the sight of their Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala while the reward of the disbelievers is Jahannam, hellfire. And then he switched the topic over to the hellfire. He said, how scorching will the fire be? 
The wrongdoers will stay therein forever. Never the intensity of the heat of the hellfire will go down or decrease. And these people will lie therein in everlasting grief and regret. Surely the wrongdoers are in error and acting in insanity. They will realize their foolishness on the day when they will be dragged upon their faces. And these people will be told, this is what you wanted. Taste what you want to taste the punishment, the result of your actions. And they will have therein to drink scalding hot water and thick black smoke. And they will try to ransom themselves on that day with all of their wealth. And they will not be able to use their wealth for anything. And they will try to ransom themselves with the price of their families and children and they will not be able to. And these people will stay in the hellfire and their skins will be peeled and they will be roasted again and again and every time their skin melts, it will be brought once again. These people will be in extreme agony and the anger of Allah will be upon them and they will never leave this state of suffering. Now after the poor man recited so many ayat and described these things about Jannah and Jahannam, the Hashimi, Musa ibn Muhammad, started to cry. He rose up from his seat and he hugged this man and he started to cry profusely. He told his friends to leave the palace. He told the girls to leave. And he sat on a rug and he started to cry and weep with regret over his sins. He started crying about his life and how he has wasted his life. He wasted all of his time, he wasted his money. And he's starting to come now to a point of understanding the purpose of his life, understanding what needs to be done. So what he did is that he started talking to this young man and asking him, how could he become better? How can I improve? How can I repent for everything bad that I've ever done? And so the young man, the poor young man who was reciting Quran started to admonish him and advise him. Repent to Allah, start a new life, refresh, renew yourself, rededicate yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The noble man Musa ibn Muhammad made sincere tawbah. He started crying, made tawbah, and then the next day he made a covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he would never return to these sins again. And the next day he goes out to the people and he makes a public tawbah so that people know that what he was doing was wrong, so that they don't follow him. He said, I repent for everything that I've done. And he started to pray in a corner of the masjid, leading a life of devotion and seclusion. And he gave away all of his wealth in charity. He gave away his palace, imagine. He gave away all of his wealth, distributed his belongings and his clothings to the poor. He dismissed all of his servants and he freed all of his slaves. And he started to spend his money for the cause of Allah. He started to try to make up for the wrongs that he had done to other people. He started to pay all that was due from him to the people. And he returned everything that was taken forcefully or wrongfully from others. He returned them back to their owners. And then he entered a life of real repentance, a life of real ibadah. And he started to eat simple food and to live with simple clothing. He would stand in the night, all night praying qiyam, praying to hajjud. He, was, he would fast every day and he would lead a life of self-mortifying austerities. He would try as much as possible to turn back to Allah. So much that the people of the time, they would come to look at him and they would say to him, they would advise him, stop punishing yourself. You're doing too much. You're going to an extreme. They said, take pity on yourself. Allah is merciful. Allah is Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. His bounty is beyond our imagination. He gives huge awards for little efforts. But he would respond and say, oh my friends, you have no idea how much I sinned against Allah. I have defied every commandment of his day and night. I indulge in the most terrible desires and crimes. I've done everything you can possibly imagine. And he would start to cry again and again, thinking about his sins and thinking about his past. This young man, Musa al-Hashimi, he goes back to his people and he tells them, I'm leaving. He travels all the way on foot to Hajj, to perform Hajj. He gets to Hajj carrying only a few small provisions with simple clothes. He reaches Mecca, he performs the Hajj successfully and he stays there in Mecca until the day he dies. Look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed this man to turn his life around. He was indulged in the worst of sins, the worst of desires. But when he heard the recitation of the Quran, he heard the message from Allah, the creator to the creation, he accepted it. So what are you going to do to accept the message that Allah sends you? What are you going to do to accept the reminder that's in front of you? He heard about Jannah and Jahannam and he repented for his sins, changed his life. Did he wait? No. He started immediately. If you want to go back to Allah, you want to turn to Allah, you want to be protected from the hellfire. Upon you is tawbah, 
repentance as soon as you commit a sin. As soon as you fall into sin, turn back to Allah. When you fall into a sin, follow it up with a good deed so your sin will be erased. Follow it up with istighfar. Follow it up with dua. Follow it up with regret and asking Allah to forgive you. Perhaps pray two rakahs, salat al tawbah. So this man repented and returned back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of the intensity of the hellfire that he had heard about. One of the scholars, Imam Tirmidhi rahimahullah, reports that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Hellfire had been lit for 1,000 years until the flames became red. Again, it was heated for another 1,000 years until the color became pure white. And again, it was burnt for another 1,000 years until its white flames turned pitch black like the darkness of the night. And the darkness of the night back then, there was no electricity. It was pitch black. And so the hellfire is not red as some people imagine it or orange. Rather, the hellfire is pitch black. Now, the hellfire affects us here on this world. It does affect us in, some, in so many ways. And some people don't understand this concept, concept, but it is very interesting. So Imam al-Bukhari reports that the Prophet wasallam said, Hellfire complained to Allah. Hellfire complained to Allah saying, Oh Allah, some parts of me have consumed other parts. Imagine, it's so hot in some areas of the hellfire that it consumed other areas. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows the hellfire allowed the hellfire to exhale, to breathe out twice, two times, once in the winter and once in the summer. And this is why you find extreme heat in the summer and extreme cold in the winter, as the Prophet ﷺ said. Furthermore, the Prophet ﷺ said, delay your prayers until it cools down for the intensity of the heat is from the exhaled air of the hellfire. Now, some people may wonder, how does this make any sense? Meaning, how does the hellfire affect us in our weather on earth? Because we have the sun. We have the sun and the distance from the sun and we have our own system of understanding the laws of this world, the physics of this world. So some people don't understand this hadith. How does the hellfire breathe out twice and it affects us in this world? And one time is in the winter. How does the hellfire breathe out and the winter is cold and breathe out in the summer and it's extreme hot? And so the scholars say this does not contradict anything that we know because as Muslims we use both our senses empirical knowledge to understand the distance of the sun and the way that weather works and we also have the revelatory knowledge the scripture the divine revelation from Allah and the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and these two are in harmony together they do not collide or conflict with one another so how do you reconcile with these two the first is that you understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes the exhaled air of the hellfire to affect the way that the sun heats our world and so if you look at the sun and the weather every single year it's different it changes. It's never, ever, ever been the same. Not a single year in history has the weather been exactly the same. And so the scholars say this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the hellfire to breathe out and it affects our sun. And the sun affects us in our weather. But we only understand it within the realm of our physical laws. As for the matters of the unseen, of where the hellfire is and how it gets into the dimension that reaches the sun, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. This is a matter of the unseen. The same way that hellfire in the Akhirah is a matter of the unseen. Furthermore, there's an interesting thing to add here, and we'll finish with this inshallah, is that one of the times that it breathes out is the cold in the winter. How is there extreme cold in the winter if this is coming from the hellfire? Some people may wonder about this because the hellfire is hot. However, one of the punishments of the hellfire is zamharir. What is zamharir? When Allah mentions in the Quran, this is a cold punishment. It is a part of the hellfire, a section of the hellfire. And it punishes people with extreme cold rather than extreme heat. And so the, the cold air is the one that comes out in the winter. And the rest of the hellfire with the hot air, the extreme heat, is the one that comes out during the summer. And so the scholars say, just as Allah created this world and created ice and fire, He's able to create both of these things and place them in one place. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manages the affairs of this world in the hereafter. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to do all things. This does conclude our episode for today. Join us next time inshallah ta'ala as we continue to discuss the hellfire and some of the deeds of the inhabitants of the hellfire. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from the punishment and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who when they hear the reminder, they hear the Quran, they turn back to Allah and they make sincere tawbah and they return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a complete, genuine, sincere repentance. Jazakumullahu khaira wa salli allahumma ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 
Let your tongue mention the shame of another. 